Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harris City. My name is Lale Hancock, and I'm one of Harris advisors. And today I have the great privilege of introducing you guys to Michael Sussman. Hello, Michael, and welcome. Yeah, hi, Lala. How are you? Oh, doing really good. Doing really good. And Michael, you know, one of the reasons that you and I met and had conversation is because of one of your organizations, um, it's called On Track North America. And really, you are being the voice, I would say, of strategy of the future and also the voice of transportation and really bringing to awareness what most of us don't even ask a question about and why most of us, when we look at a sustainable future, um, really need to have this conversation we're gonna have today. So will you give the audience, cause you know, it's such a broad audience, a little bit of like you and what even intrigued you to start this NGO and really you've been an advocate going to different states in America, educating people abroad of the importance of transportation and its strategy for us truly to have a sustainable future on planet earth. So just a little bit to talk about today. No, no, you got me excited, that's great. The, um, you know, I, I uh, so just to fast forward and then I'm gonna go back to the origination of why I started on this path. Uh, so for 27 years, we've been advising governments and uh, railroads and companies that need to ship goods on uh, capitalization and design of infrastructure projects with a particular orientation to that all infrastructure should be built to serve the community, the environment, as well as the business interest behind either yeah. the funding or the need to use it. So, um, you know, we've been out in the field uh, doing the work. Um, but with a, with a vision and a mission driven. And it started when I discovered that um, one, when you move heavy weight over land on a railroad, you know, a train on tracks versus on a truck. Uh, and I'm mostly speaking about freight transportation, although principle applies to passenger moving people as well. Um, but we move so much freight as has recently become, you know, more of a public concern. And when we do that on a, on a, a vehicle that uses rubber tires on asphalt and concrete, there's so much more friction. It takes so much more energy to move that weight. Um, if you just think of just one fact to give people a way to, to uh, yeah. relate to this, <clears throat> if you have a one mile lane on a highway, that can hold about 15 tractor trailers moving about 375 tons of, of uh, weight. When you have a one mile train, it could be right alongside that highway, <clears throat> that train holds 10,000 tons. <laughs> so so the, just the impact of how much fuel is required, and even if it's an electric train or electric trucks, you've got still that takes energy. And then it takes so much more space because those same trucks <clears throat> that would be required to move 10,000 tons would take a 27 mile of that highway. So, and con you know, there's just so many impacts uh, to society, the community to fund moving goods by truck. We need trucks. The whole point of our message, our work is that we should be integrating, you know, across the, the board and whether it's transportation, rather than counting or planning as if having modes of transportation and businesses and states and counties compete with each other. So our, our focus is on railroads and collaboration. And there's more that I can say about that. Why don't I pause for a second? Yeah, well, I mean, just even that one example that you gave, because until you and I connected, you know, when I was in Mexico, I, there's so many things when I think about sustainability. And for me, honestly, I, I moved away from the word sustainability, because we don't need to sustain what we have today, what we need is to thrive, 
We need to create the strategy for a thriving planet. And to do that, you know, one thing I love is with Hera and our, our city that we're building, you know, we're really looking into every aspect of it is being designed of not just what do we need today, but looking out the next 50, 100, 500 years, because it's not just about you and me and the time that our bodies are on the planet, but really what can we put in place today that not only empowers women, men, children, and the communities, but really where are we going? And you know, you know that for me, I focus a lot on wellness and I'm super excited about actually leading Hera Wellness for Hera as well. Um, but I hadn't even considered the train system, our, our whole you know, movement of like, when you started to describe to me, not just this example, but you know, everything that goes along with this and everything that goes along with the whole you know, moving of goods with, with automobile, you know, whatever kind it is, whatever big rig or even a car, like really how much we're not looking at the big picture yeah. We're really looking at sustainability in one little area. We're looking at how can I improve this one thing, but really stepping back, which is what you do, and look at the bigger picture. So can you help us, Michael? Can you kind of put a little bit more information here of like, what are things we need to take into consideration as we're not just building a green city, but you know, green in our own lives and green with our businesses as well. Sure. You know, one of the principles that we need to put in the dustbin of history, I would say as a civilization, is the idea that folks should just compete in business and commerce, that the goal should be to win out. Uh, and I'm going to say that, that that path that we sort of, you know, ended up with as a default, as if we'd all be better off if we all competed with each other, um, has somewhat run its course. We're at yeah. a point where we need to be thinking and planning and investing multidimensionally, as you said, for future times, as well as, you know, where did the materials come from? Where do they come from that we need to build the next project, to build the next whether it's a building or road infrastructure or rail infrastructure, what's the total relationship of that concept to the overall workability of the community, the environment, the people in it? That requires shifting to coordination and collaboration at the heart of how we think and plan, what gets brought to a table when folks sit down to meet and when you when you bring you know when you when you if, you if we think about what happens to us when we're competing we narrow in we make it about ourselves we make it about what's right in front of us competition um sort of for narrow gain when it's time to lift our horizons sit down with folks and sort of gather everyone's their views their perspectives, what they know, what concerns they have, what needs they have. And uh, what we found over being engaged in this uh, as deeply as we have is sort of blown through one of the perceptions or misperceptions that most of us suffer from. And that's the idea that if you consider everyone's views, somehow it becomes a cacophony of chaos. When in fact, if you consider everyone's views, progress becomes elegant, it gets accelerated. When you have policies and plans and investments where you've considered everyone's needs and opportunities, they flow better. You don't have the friction of now folks coming in having to fight this new development. So I, I love everything you speak about Hera in that you're really starting out with the principle of coordination, collaboration. And then everything else can naturally flow from that. Everything else is solvable. Everything else can be designed uh, you know, to last. Mm -hmm. Now, um, 
So when you have these conversations, because I know, I mean, I think when I met you, you were on a 27 city or 27 state <laughs> tour was, or a camera. There, there was three states, 70. That was good. Three, I, were, I went very fast. I did. But <laughs> three states, it was uh, 70 stakeholders, 30 meetings. Which is, oh, okay. Oh, oh, in two weeks. So yeah, yeah. it was a, it was a, a lot. Yeah. yeah. So what was it that you were trying to really get into their awareness? And what were you trying to create? Because I know that mission that you're on is actually something all of us need to be better aware of, more educated about, and really look into our own lives, our own businesses, and in our communities. Because so often, like you said, you know, you're talking about America specifically, you know, we have 50 states, um, but every state runs different a lot of times. And within the state, depending on the county or city, they run different. So, you know, you know, <laughs> you add all that up, there's a lot of different um, uncoordinated, I, I don't know if that's the right word, yeah. but you end up creating these divisions within your own environment. Um, mm -hmm. And then add that together in trying to create something that ends up being more about the oneness of, let's say, America or anywhere else. And it becomes fight of who's right, who's wrong, how they have it the correct way, everyone else needs to do it their way. So I'm just curious, like, what were you really achieving with, you know, your mission of sure. these three states and all the stakeholders? So we uh, are operating now under contract with the state of Nevada, uh, the governor's office, to lead a four state Southwest supply chain coalition. Uh, Cal those four states are California, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. Together, they, they are almost equal to the fourth largest uh, country's GDP in the world, Germany. And um, because California is the fifth largest GDP in the world, if it was a country. Um, it is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, the, so the work we're doing is speaking to and inviting stakeholders from every stakeholder group, from environmental advocacy to mining, to county and state leadership, to step into working together as a primary principle. I'm gonna, because we do so much of this and because we document every meeting that we have, it's like a research project in terms of, well, how do people respond to this? Do people naturally just put their elbows out? Do they resist it? In fact, people are, the evidence is, people are thirsting. One, to have their work, to have their business, to have their organization actually produce results. A lot of frustration with the lack of results from how things are generally organized with everybody duking it out with each other. The state, the governor of Nevada wrote a letter to the governors of California, Arizona, and Utah when he invited them to step into the Southwest Supply Chain Coalition. And I love one of the sentences in particular where he said, we all know what it's like to fight each other for the next economic development win. Perhaps it's time when we all should be thinking together and making sure, now these are, this part is, I'm gonna add in, that we're building in each state what should be in that state and not building in my state what should be in the next state. And so people really, really find their intelligence rises. When you're having a conversation for common good, everyone gets smarter. I find, you tell me what you think, as soon as you have people holding on and, and duking it out, their intelligence goes slower. There's, it's not natural, nature doesn't think that way. And there's something I love to share with you about what Charles Darwin actually said, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a chance to. No, go ahead. I love Charles Darwin. Go ahead. <laughs> I, you know, I think because we're, you know, you're doing a lot of reflecting on 
where should society be heading, what's best. Um, and I, I think that when Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, of the Species, it was about as influential a body of thinking that's ever been produced. And if we think ever since then, it stood the test of time. And I'm gonna say that it was, it, it, it succumbed unfortunately to a misreading of it. And if you think back then, middle of the 19th century, we didn't have uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble to go buy books. Books weren't that available. He wrote this book. It was popular in England. It wasn't so available in the United States and Canada, where our industrialists adopted a misreading, where they, where they advocated that everyone should be competing with each other, because Charles Darwin said, talked about survival of the fittest, only he didn't talk about survival of the fittest. What he actually wrote in Origin of the Species is that communities, rookeries, fisheries, hatcheries, they actually gave to the strongest and most ablest um, individuals the best perch, the best access to food. It wasn't those strongest taking it from the community. It was the community acting logically to ensure its own future sustainability. That's such a major difference if you're going to extrapolate that to how human beings should re relate with each other. And that's, you know, I just love that about Darwin. And he wrote about, uh, just say one more thing about it, about him. He said at the, sort of at the end of the day, when you've done all the explaining and all the investigating and, and, and uh, research, you're left without explanation at the beauty and the intricacy and the connectedness of nature. And in those moments, you can just give oh, the, the rest of the answer over to whatever you call God or spirit or energy. And he wrote that in his autobiographical writings. And so to me, um, that proper understanding that he was talking about the social element of nature. It's so important that we take that on now and get rid of this idea that we're all supposed to be, you know, duking it out to prove we're the fittest or the smartest or, uh, so I, I just think that applies to all people everywhere. Yeah, it's funny because my, my, um, my aim has been benevolent capitalism. And most people, the minute they hear capitalism, they're like, ah, I don't want to even hear about it. And they yeah. look at the misled word of benevolent. Benevolent was never created to be that it was for charity. And capitalism was never meant just about money. It actually was, benevolent is really about good for all. And capitalism was about exchange of goods. So how can we have this exchange of goods where we benefit everyone? And for me, you know, one of the beauties and one of the main reasons that I got engaged and involved um, to be part of Hera is that vision that it's not about separation. It's not about let's do something because we're going to make people better. No, it's that how do we empower people to be greater? to be a greater sense of themselves. Now, there might require some, some tools, some resources, some environmental things that they weren't exposed to before, but it really is the mission of Harris City. How do we bring all of this in one place? And our target is about empowerment of women, um, but never at the, let's empower women so we can make men not as powerful. It really is how do we bring up the woman to also know she has power, she has amazing brilliance, and that she has resources available to her. And if you know any women, we usually know they are at the source, you know? I mean, we say they have the whole community, you know, they have their family, their friends, 
strangers they interact with. And when you empower one woman, it's amazing you're empowering a whole community, if not more than one. And so when you bring this up, it really is. And you know, one thing I'm, I'm very fascinated by the different things that you bring to awareness to people is most people do not look at the amount of water consumption that is happening through our transportation systems or the lack of water that's available. And so like, it really is about all of us being willing to step back a little bit and really start to educate ourselves and become more aware of that view that becomes this oneness view. And what can each of us contribute to that oneness? Um, some of us, we might contribute in multiple areas. Some of us, it might be just that we get to be the, the voice to get this information out to more people. You know, So each of us actually has strength and we have capacities and talents that we don't even realize. So what are those things that you think are terrible about you are usually the, the things that you do so well that you just mm -hmm. don't appreciate, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so can we talk a little bit about the other side of all of this that people really need to take into consideration as they're looking to really having a thriving planet? Yes. I, there's so much great about what you just said. I, I, long ago thought that we all have the opportunity to align our economic activities with our heartfelt dreams for the world. And that if you start there, one, you're, now you're on a great path. And whether that's, you know, whatever it is you do, whether it's business, art, performance, creative work, uh, that, there's a, your heartfelt dreams for the world that you that you can align with. And there's also, and it, when you talk to people, when I ask people, or when I state that, people um, say, well, let me see, do I have heartfelt dreams for the world? And then they quickly start taking inventory. They do, almost everyone has heartfelt dreams for the world. Um, when people connect their businesses or their organizations, to a world that works for everyone, their, um, their spirit is elevated, their energy gets plugged in, they're now, they can have intelligent conversations with everyone around them. Um, I met a, a sixth generation New Mexican, uh, New Mexico is a state in the Southwest United States, been there for six generations, 40 years in forestry management and, and business it was so clear that he has a unique voice, a unique expertise. I always say there's, there may be, you know, where are we up to 8 billion people on the planet uh, now? And yeah. everyone, if you think about, um, you hear someone, a, a professional singer, we're able to hear their, who that person is of all the billions of people we all have a unique voice or a unique, unique perspective to bring. Um, and that's just not a kind of a euphemism or a nicety. It's a really important right now as we go to redesign society, infrastructure, towns, systems, counties, we want to have everybody's uh, perspective. So um, I, I mean, this is, you know, you're, you're talking here about what we're advocating for. It's just great that you're this connected to it in your work and in Hera that uh, you've got also the broad understanding that it's not just about building Algae, I'm guessing you'll be back any second. That's great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. Hotel, internet, you never know what you're going to get, no matter how great the country is. <laughs> um, Use the glitches, that's for sure. All yeah, right. 
Yeah. So Michael, if there was like three things for people to really take into consideration um, around, you know, sustainability or, you know, thriving planet, what, what were three things that you would say they really need to have a little more awareness about? Sure. One is uh, bring all truths, all realities of the environmental challenges that we're dealing with. Bring it right front and center to what your plans are. And uh, uh, whether that's uh, the, the availability of uh, municipal water in your area, which is uh, decreasing you know, around the world, whether it's um, how goods are gonna move to and from the new factory or the new warehouse, um, whether it's the environmental impact of mining activities and whether we need to have more of what your current, you know, what that mining operation produces, whatever the environmental, whatever the realities are about one's business activities, commercial activities, commerce, bring it right front and center. And the more we do that, the more aligned your business is going to be with future success because increasingly the environment has a say in commerce. It's increasingly disrupting, destroying infrastructure, for instance. So don't shy away from anything. And that's really important because so many industries, regions are still suffering under it, not being safe yet for people to speak their fears and concerns and their realities about what's happening all around us for fear of being shunned or being outcast or being blackballed within an industry. So that, I don't know if that was two things or five things, but um, yeah. uh, thinking, oh, and one more, I wanted to hit three. Um, it's actually more productive to think at a larger system level than it is to narrow down for so long. And it's made, I could, you could say it's a patriarchal sort of masculine uh, approach to life is to sort of narrow down, focus in, think that getting a project done makes one uh, a, 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 a you know, results producer. And that somehow thinking in systems, thinking of the whole community is somehow philosophical or more difficult flip that over. It's the other way around. The more you work on a project with the whole system in mind, the more productive and profitable and successful that individual project or activity is going to be. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have Harris City. The first one is being um, put in place today. Um, our bricks or the first brick will be laid down soon. I'm not sure we're still waiting on the date. It was going to be October, but the country we're working with, they are so eager to get started so much sooner. So we'll see what our new um, date will be. Um, so looking five years down the road, 10 years down the road, what do you perceive with Harris City? And like, what's your vision of Harris City, I guess, is a better way of asking. Sure. Um, there's, you know, <clears throat> for so long, we've gone down the path of specialization, you know, mm -hmm. separating sciences, uh, uh, getting into narrow, narrow fields of engineering. So I think I can see you heading toward, this is where we're going to sort of open the lens again, shift to thinking of integration rather than separation. And uh, so, you know, to, to, to model how it is we need to redesign cities and communities um, and rework what we already have as we, you're, you know, Hera is a blessing in that it's, it's, a, it's an open space and we can create with all the best. That doesn't mean that redoing, replanning what's already there. I mean, that's gonna be so important going forward. So 
I see Hera being an absolutely wonderful opportunity to model for the rest of the world, the principles and the principles in action, whole systems thinking and collaboration. Yeah. And I, I also get one of the other things is that, you know, I get to work, you know, directly with the people who are involved with Harris City and the fact that they don't think they already have it right. You know, I think that's one of the key things that keeps getting me even more and more excited with Hera. And um, there's so many people engaged, involved with so many different backgrounds, but yet all the voices are being heard. And, you know, so often we think our voice is just whatever comes out of our vocal cords, but I actually have a whole program that I facilitate around the world called Right Voice For You. And that's just one of the ways that you share your voice with the world. Yeah. And so some people literally, it may not be vocally they're saying something, but they're bringing information or they're bringing resources or there's just different ways that they're sharing what they know and their voice forward. Um, and I'd like to see that more in municipalities, in governments, in private organizations, you know, because um, each employee and each person of your family has value. They know things that no one else knows. You know, they're able to perceive things no one else can perceive. So like you said at the beginning, the importance of bringing everyone together, allowing their voices to be heard so that you have the information doesn't mean that you have to go with what they need, okay? Because we can't fulfill everyone's need. That's just never gonna happen. But having that in your awareness and in the strategy that you're building to know that it's actually going to move forward instead of your perspective, get there, get the roadblocks, and then it's never successful anyway, because mm -hmm. everyone's just going to spend their energy resisting. Uh, <laughs> so I always do that. I'm also a consultant working with a lot of businesses. That's my first thing is like, who can we engage with at the beginning? <laughs> You're um, demonstrating something that um, I, I heard from a woman recently at, at a, uh, a business dinner. And she um, uh, stands out because uh, I work in a, in a primarily male industry, the railroad industry. And she came also before this from the mining industry, which also tends to be a male-oriented uh, yeah. industry. And I asked her, you know, I have my views of, of what women bring in terms of collaboration and partnership. And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what is it you've seen in terms of your own success uh, in these male industries? And her answer was just so great. She said, well, we tend to be much, we tend to be really good listeners. And that sounds somewhat obvious when, you know, if you know women, but it just, it just, bringing that into the in industrial space really impressed me. You know, she said, we're able to, to perceive how people are listening in a room and then be with that and address it. And I, I'm thinking of all the men that I know that have a hard time listening and <laughs> think that they just have to do a better job at getting their points across. Um, so I, everything, you know, in everything you're speaking, you're expressing that view of being open and being, you know, a learning person. Yeah. Michael, we're at the end of our show for today. And I'm just curious, you know, if you had like one word of advice or anything that you'd like to share with all the people that are listening and Anything about empowering the women to be leaders, what would you say? Sure. Um, take one page from men and, and be willing to tout your strengths and your accomplishments. <laughs> women are so wonderful and doing so much and often just being, you know, doing it um, unselfishly. And I'd say, Hang, hang in there with men where you, where you bring your accomplishments forward and make sure that they, they know it. Yeah, that is definitely one we need to have a little more confidence with. It's not throwing it in their face, but 
don't hide from it either, yeah. you know? So it really is that we have to work on that. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, it's been such Thanks. a pleasure having you here. I'm so grateful for you and all that you are educating and bringing into awareness and collaboration and really creating a future, not just for America, but truly for the planet to be able to be a thriving planet. So thank you for all you're doing every single day. We're so grateful. And um, I look forward to actually having you come to our first Terrace City. <laughs> and, um, and what else is possible? Yes. And thank you everyone for watching today. And um, truly what else is possible? Like Michael was saying, when we're no longer looking at it from a laser perspective, but that we actually go out and we're willing to look at it from the bigger frame of oneness. So thank you everyone. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And if you guys have any questions or would like to share any comments, you could do that below or even you can go to harriscity.org and the contact page and let us know. So see you guys really soon. Thank you so much, Michael. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.